up from the 36 chambers, we have Project Camelot in the house. Check it out. This is Buzzsaw. Central Intelligence Agency. It was described by witnesses as... Carrie Cassidy made a name for herself starting the Project Camelot uh, forum for interviews with whistleblowers, um, oddballs, and alike. I mean, it was, it's an amazing uh, library that they've, uh, they've, that they've developed over the last eight years with over 400 hours of interviews. And you would name it, any, any major whistleblower or alien uh, conspiracy theorist, uh, abductee, has been, has been interviewed on their show. And she's here today to talk about her own personal experiences with the extraterrestrial, the paranormal, what, you know, what she thinks is coming. So, Carrie, thanks for joining us. Um, Project Camelot is a household name for conspiracy theorists, I think, and you've done a tremendous job in eight years of, of, of you know, interviews, and you name it. you've brought people out of the woodwork that many people, you know, for the first time, stepping forth has always been through Project Camelot. So, you know, you've done a great job, and I wanted to, you know, really begin by asking, what does it come from? What was your inspiration to do this show to just take a camera and start, you know, start interviewing your, your contacts and you know people on these on these very bizarre X file subjects. Well, first of all, I consider it conspiracy fact, not not theory. <laughs> conspiracy fact, or just the people? You could say anecdotal. It's more anecdotes because a lot well, of well, actually, of it's witness testimony. Testimony, exactly. Yeah. And yes, uh, it's it's all based on human testimony. In other words, live human testimony. I. I do, I'm a guerrilla filmmaker, uh, so I just basically put a camera in front of somebody's face and get uh, their honest story as they, they see it, and I ask them the hard questions. Um, I'm known as a somewhat relentless interviewer, <laughs> and right now I'm in the other seat. Absolutely. Um, but I, I got into this because, uh, well, that's a long story. But basically, I had my own uh, sort of ET, otherworldly experiences as a child. And then what happened was that I studied Eastern philosophy. I um, decided I wanted to reach uh, enlightenment, and I connected all my chakras through uh, multiple, uh, well, uh, samadhi experiences and kundalini, activating kundalini, and so on. And then... Um, I kind of continued on that path. Then I went to work in Hollywood for 20 years, and I got frustrated mm -hmm. with the glass ceiling and decided to pick up a consumer-grade camcorder and um, go out and, and start interviewing the authors and the people that were on the circuit talking about UFOs and so on. I thought it would be a lark. And um, what happened was that as I started to do it, I found that I was good at it. And I would get a testimony, and I would get people to talk about themselves, and, and they would reveal things to me. So um, I then partnered with Bill Ryan. We ended up going to uh, Tim Tagel in England, and I was, we were both inspired by the, uh, the Camelot story, the vision of a utopian society where it was a horizontal uh, without a hierarchy, and we wanted to get the truth out, so we decided to uh, take my skills as a filmmaker. And I had worked in Hollywood. I'd written screenplays. I'd worked for top producers and um, also shopped projects around Hollywood for, for a good long time. And so uh, we took my skills uh, on that level and his as a webmaster. And we kind of put our skills to set together and created Project Camelot. And we haven't looked back. Um, people really went crazy for it in the very beginning and continued to this day, really. Um, we have a huge audience out mm -hmm. there and uh, continue to interview. I mean, I've done probably hundreds of, of, you know, like 500 interviews, but I have a radio show and I interview. Um, you know, we traveled the world, basically, with the camera. And we were unusual because we were such a, a small team. We didn't have all the bells and whistles and the right lights and so on. Right. Um, but we, we got the real testimony. Mm -hmm. And you've done a great job of, of sorting that and creating a library. Mm -hmm. But to begin, it, where, what would 
how would you describe your early experiences? I mean, would, would you say, would you be able to identify what kind of beings you were in touch with? You know, obviously we, we've heard sure. the stories of the Nord, there's the Nordics, there's the reptilians, there's the greys, there's certain categories of aliens. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it was that you were contacted by? Uh, well, I seem to have a, a link up with the Pleiadians for one thing. Um, and at one point I had, uh, we went to see Billy Meyer in, in Switzerland and we couldn't get a, an appointment to have an interview. So we went on a Sunday in the morning and uh, just uh, Bill Ryan and myself and, and we were sort of hanging out there waiting for the place to open. And he has this big plaque that has a silver star on it and it's all silver. And I stood in front of it and he took my picture, you know, we were playing around and taking pictures. Um, and the picture came out silver. And no other picture before or since has ever come out silver that I've taken. We've taken hundreds of thousands because I'm a photographer and we're always doing that kind of thing. And uh, it was uh, George Green, uh, who's one of the people I've in interviewed in the past, uh, had the same experience where he had something strange happen when he went on the property where Billy Meyer lived. But the Pleiadians use the silver star and that's, that's their sort of emblem. So it was just a weird sort of like maybe a little message from the Pleiadians to me. Wasn't it Alistair Crowley that started the, the Silver Star Lodge? The, uh, he, yeah, the AA but you know, it's interesting that they that. both use, the Illuminati actually uses the Silver Star, but so do the Pleiadians. Um, and I can't account for that. Um, <laughs> because because, because you, you, don't, you think that the Pleiadians are, not think, but generally the Pleiadians are associated with like the Brotherhood of Light, more of like the light beings who are Yes, they're, they're more positive in but theory. You, you don't think that there's, do you, th you, do you associate the Illuminati entirely with darkness? You don't think that there's any faction or anything that, let's say, that is a higher order of intelligence within the Illuminati that uses both dark and light, let's say? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, there are good people in every sort of organization, and the Illuminati is no exception. Um, but there's a large portion of the Illuminati that are focused on a dark path, uh, and they're also persuaded to be. I believe there are light workers or people that also cross over. They start off on the dark side and then cross over into the light. Um, and, and so, you know, if you're an official member of the Illuminati, for the most part, you are probably walking a dark path until such time as you make a conscious decision to change, you know, and, and in essence, you might not be an Illuminati after that. You know, you're something else entirely, but uh, a whistleblower probably. <laughs> Lower, indeed. But uh, yeah, so do you from the from the number of people you've interviewed? Do you uh, can you recall anyone that you really believe was was in the Illuminati, the official organization as such? Sure. Like which which which? People? Well, Leo Zagami for one, definitely a member of the Illuminati, um, and we interviewed him uh, in Norway. He was a, a, a whistleblower from the Vatican, um, you know, from the P two. Lodge, um, which is, you know, yeah, familiar the with that. Yeah, Freemasonic. Uh, yeah. Propaganda, propaganda due, right? Apparently P1 was what, was formed by Mazzini, was it, or Garibaldi in the, night, or when was P1? Wasn't that I don't know. You know, I'm not that familiar with the Dark Lodges, but I can say that, you know, definitely Leo was from the P2 and still is. And he went back, um, and they are run by the Black Pope, what's known as the Black Pope. The Jesuit Pope. Yeah. But isn't Francis now both yeah, a black Yeah, so pope now we have black and white. And white, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah, do you quite think, interesting. Do you think he'll be the last pope? Uh, well, I think that's the prophecy, although there may be one more after him if he has a short reign. Well, that was supposed to be Ratzinger, right? His reign was cut short. Yeah. So that apparently Francis would be the last in that, in that prophecy. In theory. In theory. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah. So as far as the Illuminati goes, because, you know, people always ask me, and frankly, I always say, look, I don't know exactly what it means. You know, I, th I know it exists. I think that there's different meanings for it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's orders of the Illuminati. Even within Masonry, there's, you know, Illuminati orders that I know of, right? Yeah. Um, but as far as this global, you know, group, it, that you think it's, it associates uh, most closely with the Vatican? And, the, and, and uh, for example, in like the Royal uh, the Scottish Rite, uh, masonry? Mm -hmm. Would that be your understanding of the Illuminati? Well, 
Yes. I mean, you know, there are all levels, right? And, uh, and so it just depends where you're going to, what you're going to talk about. Um, I would say that the Vatican heavily is, 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 a, is a big influence on what is in essence the Illuminati. But you're talking about a pyramid and a certain level of being close to the top. Um, honest, they may not even consider the Vatican, you know, that, that may be a step down from a certain level of the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Illuminati, for all intents and purposes, are black magicians. Um, and they are also individuals with an agenda mm -hmm. for planet Earth. And most of what, if you've ever studied Aleister Crowley, then you, you know the philosophy, the occult philosophy that they follow. Mm -hmm. But in my view, you know, being a magician is not necessarily a, a dark thing. There can be light magicians and dark magicians. Right. So it just depends uh, which you choose, which path, again, you choose. Right. And I fully believe that actually Project Camelot has existed this long because the powers that be, um, we have friends in high places, so to speak. And so there will be members that are, in essence, Illuminati, hidden members of the Illuminati, ones that are keeping a low profile, even among their membership, um, that will be supporting us. And I've, been, I've gotten letters from various people who've contacted me that are, I would say, you know, they're Masons, they're Free, Freemasons, they're mm -hmm. um, Templars, you know, and, and the Templars are not all negative either. Right. Exactly. I mean, I think that's, that's a big misconception that, you know, we try on shows like this, you know, we try to have conversation because the point is, you know, it's not that all Freemasons are bad. It's not like an evil boogeyman group. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, I think that they associate with what people would call jinns, spirits, entities, angel, you know, mm -hmm. alien, right? Yeah. But, again, they're not all bad entities, right? We, you know, just because from True. a Christian, maybe from a hardcore Christian point of view, you know, anything that's not an angel, the demon, right? And yet, as we know, historically speaking, daemons are what, Socrates, what inspired Socrates. I mean, it's like part of the personal genie or genius. So there are these spirits or entities that are neither angelic nor evil, demonic, that, that, people, asso that people interact with and associate with. Right. Uh, well, I would consider, uh, you know, I don't, I don't look at the world as just angels and demons. Uh, you know, I believe that there are lots of different kinds of beings. Some incarnate into bodies and some of the bodies are all different levels of light. Uh, or dark, and uh, and and so I'm not. Div and also, it's important to realize that angels are not typically angel angelic in the sense that people think they are. That's a that's a misconception. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the the so-called halo that you see around uh, beings of light is 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 really more about activated Kundalini energy, um, and that's it's a misunderstanding to think of that person as being therefore angelic mm -hmm. um but that's so. that's more positive right if you if you have a halo that means you're ascended not to a necessarily level. because an activate i mean you can uh, the dark side knows that they can activate the kundalini and and have a dark agenda so you, that's where you get a dark magician interesting so they yeah. still have the they still have activated they, the kundalini, oh, absolutely. but they would have a darker halo yes um now they will have trouble with some of their chakras the, the chakras will not all be um you know pure and clear um, and they will have emphasized certain chakras over others like the mental chakra as opposed to the heart chakra mm -hmm. right exactly where so we'll have an underdeveloped heart chakra and the lion, that's what we need the lion heart the, uh, the mm -hmm. Christ the Christ consciousness is from yes. the heart so as far as the bloodlines are concerned I mean there is obviously this issue of the Illuminati, Illuminati bloodlines and a, an awareness of, of families who want to preserve a bloodline or let's say they continue yes. to intermarry. What does the blood have to do with that, as far as incarnation purposes? Do you know? Well, what I say is, is, is there are at least um, we humans are a hybrid race, and so we're made up of twelve or more ET races. Uh, their genetics, they're all combined in us in different amounts, and uh, this is where you get, in essence, what humans are: is boots on the ground, is what I call them, um, and that goes for the Illuminati as well. And they tend to have more reptilian genes, um, at least a good portion of them. And the reptilian agenda is not always negative, so it's important to understand that some reptilians, um, the Shakars, for example, are the su supposed royalty of the reptilian class, the Draco. Um, 
And then there are the reptilians, which are more like snake-type mm -hmm. rep reptilians. There are many, many reptilian races, and not all are negative, or service to self, as we say. Right. Um, there are at least two, though, that are service to self that would that want to take over. Their agenda is to take over the Earth, to take it back from humans. Um, and uh, they feel that they were here first, at least one of those races. And... Uh, there is evidence that at least one of the races comes from Aldebaran, and this is who the Nazis were in communication with. I see. So this, so two different reptilian races initially here, and the ones that the Nazis were communicating with were from Aldebaran, but ultimately the Nazis haven't died out. I mean, that's no. one of the interesting things I think that people <laughs> have to understand is that anything the, but a lot of the Illuminati tends to be. Um, Within the, like how do you say within the hierarchy does seem to be operating under the influence of Nazi type of characters, neo Nazis or the bloodlines that relates to, you know to the hierarchy of the Nazis. Is that what you've seen here? Like as far as the United States is concerned, even. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, this is where you know you, I bring in my whistleblowers. So first of all, there's uh, you know the Jim Mars, you know Joseph Farrell, uh, talking about the Fourth Reich, mm -hmm. uh, which is the name of a book that Jim Mars has written and. Uh, and it's all about how the United States brought the uh, Nazi scientists over in paperclip and that they started the secret space program. And uh, the, the part that is in the general public is, of course, um, Los Alamos, you know, and, and, and the nuclear bombs and so on and so forth. But it went much far beyond that, um, you know, involved building UFOs, going interplanetary, and so on. So we're really talking about a highly developed secret space program that probably started around the time in the 1940s. And there's even evidence that, for example, um, the, the Nazis themselves may have been influenced by Tesla and Tesla technology. So that a lot of people think that the Nazis, you know, being in con uh, contact with this race from Aldebaran, which was through these women psychics, the Brill. or uh, yeah, the Vril, that were getting um, this information. But there's also evidence that they may have been. There was an, a, a dialogue, in other words, and the Bushes were financing the Nazis from early on, from before they became, you know, what was in essence the 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 Third Reich, I mm -hmm. guess you might call it. But again, this goes back to genetics and why the interest in right, racial so, theory, because as we know, the Bush Harriman clan were very heavily involved in the early genetics programs here that mm -hmm. actually inspired Hitler, right? The first sure. genetics conference, eugenics conferences were held in the United States. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but, but again, there's, there's a faction that, of those scientists that went to Russia. There's a faction that went to Argentina. And they have underground bases at this point. And uh, Werner von Braun, of course, is one of the more well-known Nazi paperclip scientists. Who, who I think virtually ran the secret space program for a very long time in the early days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that he knew a great deal more than he, he revealed. He seems to have a very checkered past. And uh, I don't know if you've ever spoken to Carol Rosen, who worked with him and for him, I believe. Um, she knew him quite well. However, I, I also think that perhaps either she doesn't know his true past or she doesn't reveal it. And, you know, this is the type of thing where it's all about national security of this country, mm -hmm. uh, what, what level the secret space program really is at. Right. And I've got whistleblowers such as Jake Simpson that says they're about 10,000 years in advance of what we're living in now. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I was boggled. My mind was boggled by the realization that the NSA had computers that were operating in 1965 at the level that our computers, the public had in 2000, were operating at. So right. We, what we got in 2000 was what the secret government had in 65. Absolutely. How about that? Right. Yeah, it's it, it's really incredible. And when you when you know that things about this, I mean, I I'm pretty deep into the secret space program, as you can appreciate. Um, and that's where most of my whistleblowers are giving us testimony, even behind the scenes. And and let me say that whistleblowers at this time have really um, sort of quieted down. I think that what has gone on with Edward Snowden and uh, with Julian Assange has uh, sort of scared them to some degree, where a lot of them are going to ground, a lot of them are not wanting to go before the camera. Now I'm hoping that'll turn around with shows like yours, which will bring more attention on an international level to where people realize that if, and our policy at Camelot has been 
the best place to hide is out in the open. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you can get more famous as a whistleblower, and I'm saying this to the whistleblowers out there, um, you know, it is your job, it is your duty to report to humanity what's really going on. Because our, our, our humanity is basically experiencing a split. There's a rogue civilization that's become the secret space program and that is going off planet and that is going interstellar, creating bases on places like moons of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, Arthur C. Clarke wrote about this. He was a person who was very well read into the sp secret space program even when he was alive. And I think it inspired a lot of his science fiction. Well, maybe Kubrick knew something about it too from working with him on 2001 and potentially uh, doing the... Doing the, the documented moon landing as opposed to the real one. Yes, and, and I, as far as I'm concerned, and, and based on our whistleblowers, again, such as Henry Deacon, who came out under his own name, Arthur Neumann, later, um, the, they did, we did go to the moon. So it's not that we didn't go to the moon, but they also filmed something so that they would have a, a record because they knew that what they would encounter there. And they didn't know if they, they could get reveal, footage. They couldn't have revealed possibly what was really on the moon because... Yes, all the beings that are on the moon. And, uh, you know, I think that the moon is also a heavy-duty gray base. Um, and that gets into the grays and, and what they're doing here and the whole abductions and so on. Mm -hmm. How do you not get lost with all the, the whistleblowers you deal with? I mean, how do you not, in a sense, just your head starts to swim because oftentimes stories can contradict each other and, you know, you, have one, you get one bad seed in, you know, in the bucket and all of a sudden you're not quite sure what to believe anymore. Well, from my point of view, first of all, after, you know, this is not just like a hobby. We, we got into this very seriously um, for eight years, and I've done it for eight years. Uh, Bill was my partner for the first four, and then he's gone off and done his own thing since then. So I carried on. And um, when you're into this world, you're into it 24-7. You know, a story can come at any time. And as an investigative journalist, I'm investigating. I'm always open to whatever's coming, to, you know, to me. And with the Internet being what it is, Facebook, I mean, I've got, you know, 5,000 Facebook friends on all my different pages, which, what is that, 15,000 or more. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, I've got 100,000, you know, close to 100,000 YouTube, you know, people and I have subscribers. And we've got, you know, millions of people that have seen our videos around the world and all of this. So I have people contacting me constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, I get people that are absolutely out of their minds, <laughs> and uh, I get people that are in between, and then I get people that are really have something to say, and they know what they're talking about. Right. And being able to tell the difference is, no, it's not easy, but first of all, I'm an intuitive, uh, so that helps me in my work and always has, and it's paid off very well, let me say. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, I studied this sector before I got into it, so I really went in all directions. I studied Eastern philosophy, you know, I studied the occult, right. so I had a really good foundation. In knowledge, I mean, it's Yeah, exactly. and so you can't really pull the wool over my eyes so easily. Um, now, that's not to say that our whistleblowers don't, do they always tell the truth, because people always want to know that. And what I say is that, Sometimes they will give you disinfo just to save their own lives mm -hmm. because you must understand that if somebody is whistleblowing, they know full well that they could be, you know, shot in the head tomorrow. And the surveillance society that we live in is so intense and so complete and so pervasive, in fact, way beyond what Edward Snowden has released so far, which Camelot had, you know, we knew this, uh, you know, one year into, into Camelot. And this is now, you know, eight years later. I assure you that our whistleblowers had clued us into all of that, the surveillance that's going on, which involves quantum computers and, and scalar weaponry and uh, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they did not lose plane 370, by the, by the way. I mean, they know where it is. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that goes on, but it has to do with a, a war, a secret war that's being fought between various factions of humans and ETs, and um, some of our military is, is aligned with different groups of ETs. Uh, some of the Brits are invo involved with another group, the Russians with another group, the Chinese with another group. So it's, it's a huge sort of um, massive game that's, that's being played right now. Do you know roughly what the, what the factions look like? Yeah, 
I, I do. I, I don't know exactly, you know, I don't know all the ET groups because there are many of them visiting Earth right now. Um, we know some of the, what you call the usual suspects, right? But uh, recently I interviewed Captain Mark Richards and um, I actually went to interview him in prison. He's in Vacaville. Mm -hmm. He's been there for over 30 years. He was framed for murder. Uh, he was a captain in the Navy, so, and his father was also uh, you know, a military man. I think he, his father was, I can't remember whether it was the Air Force or the Army, but uh, they invaded Dulce, the underground base Dulce, and rescued some humans that were being experimented on there. Um, they were part of a raid. Uh, you know, I, so um, what, I, what I'm saying about Mark Richards is that, that he's a person who said that there were, that there are at least two races of reptilian species that are, are here that are, are hostile, uh, that do want to take over the earth. And the greys, several of the races, I would say, a few of the races of greys are fully reptilian and they report to this group of, of reptilians. Um, but that there is a group called the raptors, which uh, Mark Richards talks lots about and has had constant interaction with when he was in the secret space program. And it's, it's really interesting because that group never hits the news. Nobody ever talks about raptors. Right. You know what I mean? Are we talking like dinosaurs? I mean, do they, do they have any resemblance to the dinosaur raptors? Or uh, more I think they do, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, velociraptors or right. something like that. I'm not sure exactly how they look. I mean, he was describing, you know, I went, went to this prison and I interviewed him for two hours straight and I sat closer than I'm sitting to you right now mm -hmm. and just peppered him with questions nonstop, as right. you can appreciate. Because yeah. the guy with this kind of knowledge, you know, you just don't want to let him go and I only had limited time. I couldn't take notes. I couldn't have a tape recorder, nothing. They wouldn't allow anything in the prison. But I just remembered all of it, and, and then I do this, I have this video I called Total Recall, because I walked out of the prison and we turned on the tape recorder and we just went, right. and I just, you know, regurgitated basically every, everything I heard. But so it was the ultimate, I mean, for people that don't have to understand, we are living amongst aliens at all times, basically. It's like men in black. They look human, but they're not. Right. That's the idea. Yes, and apparently men, men in black is quite accurate. accurate. I mean, what you've got is you've got a, a secret space program and a secret government that is using the media, especially the entertainment industry, to release all of this information. And the television shows you're watching right now are doing, they're releasing truth all the time. Mm -hmm. But they put it in the guise of fiction. Right. And uh, this is actually why I got into Hollywood. I wanted to make sci-fi blockbusters. That was what I really wanted to do. Yeah. But when I reached the ceiling and I couldn't get anywhere, I just you know, decided to go off and do documentaries. And so that's, I'm actually on my way back to make feature films right. based on all the incredible information that we've gotten, these incredible testimonies. But in the process, in Hollywood, did you ever come across the, the secret side of it, let's say? You know, because obviously we know there's a, there's a history of relationship sure. between Wall Street and Hollywood, between, between the military and Hollywood, yeah. and the Illuminati, you name it. I mean, obviously it's a beacon of media. So, of course, there's going to be an influence and power structure as far as what gets projected into the minds of people. Did you ever conf confront any of these factors? Yes. I mean, yeah. And I had direct experience because Project Camelot, we, um, we were involved in a, in a true TV uh, pilot. And they, it was based around what I do in Project Camelot, Bill Ryan and myself. And uh, the whole, you know, we went out, we interviewed witnesses. Um, it was shot on the road. And uh, we, we had some of our top witnesses in the show. And they shot it. Um, it was supposed to be, a, I think it was an hour or two hour pilot. I think an hour. Um, and uh, it was actually very good. It's on YouTube, so you can watch it. Um, it's also on our website. Um, they didn't go to series. But what happened during the shooting of the pilot is uh, one of our witnesses, who is also a CIA agent, asset, whatever you want to call him, Gordon Novell, who's since passed on. He's, he's oh, no sure. longer here. No, well, no, yeah. Knowing Gordon Novell, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, uh, well, you knew? No, I okay. just know <laughs> the story. This guy pops up all over the place in every conspiracy you can name. Well, I mean, I, okay, I got to know him pretty well. And uh, he, he actually called me up. During the shooting, he was in the, he's in the TV show as well. We interview him on screen, so you can see him if you're not familiar with him. Um, but he's like a, you know, he kind of had this persona that was a little like a 1940s gangster in, his, in the way he acts. Um, 
And he was part of all kinds of clandestine operations, uh, part of the Nixon administration, and uh, even had said to be possibly involved in the Kennedy assassination, although he always denied it. But uh, he called me up and he said, I'm going to admit to you that I am a CIA agent and they want to make an offer to your producer um, that if the producer will make a deal with them, that, uh, that, that your show will go to series and, and, and we will be on board with it. So as long as you allow that, um, you guys can go right ahead. So I connected him with my producer and uh, the producer basically said, no way. And what happened? We shot the pilot. They put it in the can. They put it on the shelf for two, two years. True TV wouldn't even release it. When they did release it, finally, they had no advertising whatsoever. Um, they didn't notify us. They didn't notify the producer or the director. They just sort of slipped it out there. Right. Um, but, but someone had seen their schedule, you know, because they put it out there a week ahead of time mm -hmm. that week. And they notified us. So we did this, like, media blitz, letting people know that it was, it was going to be screened. And, uh, you know, I, it did all right in the ratings as a result. But, uh, yeah, it was killed. Right. Well, it reminds me of last season of Conspiracy Theory on True TV. There you go. And, and, and actually, um, wasn't it um, Fred Bell that, that died he, right he, after a series? He, uh, yeah, he died about a day after meeting with Jesse and telling Jesse personally that he had encountered gray aliens at underground bases yeah. off camera. But right. he, had, he had told them some things and basically said, my CIA handler would have liked if I, if I told you this. There you but, go. You know, yes, I definitely see the grays. Not sure about the reptilians. He hadn't experienced any reptilians, but mm -hmm. confirmed at least a couple of gray encounters. Um, and again, you hear, this more, you hear this from people who are inside, mm -hmm. and um, it, there's no benefit to them to be admitting these things unless that's their real experience. Yeah. yeah. Right. But anything else as far as Hollywood was concerned that really struck you or you want to um, Let's see. Uh, I, you know, yeah, there was another encounter that I had, uh, <laughs> which was um, basically I, I, uh, I was contacted by some very high level. I'm not going to use any names here because, you know, my sympathies are with these particular producers. Uh, they, they meant well. Um, and they, they're very high level. Um, and very well known if I said their, one of their names, you know, everyone would know the name. Um, and uh, they were very interested in Camelot and what we did. And they came across one of our interviews uh, with Dan Burish. And we, they wanted to make a movie of it. And we went down the road a certain distance. And uh, then they got a phone call. And they were basically told to drop it. And, um, you know, so the, one of the producers came and, and told me. Um, but, but, but I also was told that there was a very... Um, Okay, I have to be careful here because I don't want to, I want to reveal a certain amount. Um, there, there is a, a certain faction of Hollywood that is a, a high-level high entertainers that are very, very monitored by um, the Illuminati. And uh, there's a lot of black magic going down in, in Hollywood, a lot of Satanism. As you we got a taste know. of it at the, at the Oscars this year. I, don't know if <laughs> I asked people at times, did you notice the fact that the A in the Oscar was a giant pyramid with, this, with the Oscar statue in the middle? And oh. they did a, a Wizard of Oz ceremony with Whoopi Goldberg dressed as a first-degree first, uh, first degree Mason coming on stage to present it. Sure. And it's like people don't realize it, but it was wide. It was completely out there in the open for them. Well, they're selling a lot of vampirism and, uh, and also Katy Perry, of course, in, in her, uh, I think that was part of the, the Oscars or whatever it was. Probably one of the music um, ceremonies, Grammys yeah. or something. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, you know, all, all the symbolism is there. Um, they're kind of selling Satanism right now in Hollywood. It's, it's wild and quite bizarre. But uh, yeah, so anyway, what I was saying was that a certain group is, is very, and it has to do with the music industry as well, mm -hmm. heavy duty, you know, uh, sort of control of the music industry and, and the players. And the, and the stars. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and based on whistleblower information as well, Michael Jackson was murdered. Um, Whitney Houston was murdered. Um, these people were all victims of, of Satanism in Hollywood. So as far as what you're saying, is, as far as the influence for the entertainers, was there, was there, was there something else you were connect, getting, at, getting at with that? Well, just that this particular group is being... Um, you know, they're coerced, shall we say. In other words, they don't have the freedom 
that, well, let me just say that the, um, that black performers and black producers and, and, and anyone in that area is, is very coerced by, by this Illuminati group, more so than, white, than the white side. Hmm. And, uh, but they both are. So, you know, it's, it's not like either one of escapes it so much as the coercion is much stronger in the, in the music industry over the, over the black performers. Yeah. Well, this year, 12 Years a Slave was the big winner, but I felt like Brad Pitt was the bigger winner. Uh, so if, if you were going to say what we're, we're at this turning point now, you know, post-2012, nothing, no major cataclysm occurred. This is not the end of the world. You know, are, do we see any, any light at the, end of the, at the end of the tunnel? Do we see any, like, you know, dawn on the absolutely. horizon? Is there anything positive <laughs> coming from all these, you know, from, from all these, uh, this darkness that we've experienced, let's say, and the control of the Illuminati of the last, you know, few thousand years? Yes, because as far as I'm concerned, people like you and I, and there are many out there doing the same kind of job. In other words, we're waking people up. And as the consciousness rises on planet Earth, this is the real, real sort of enemy of the Illuminati and the controllers, so to speak. We're basically breaking the bonds of, of you know, us as slaves here on the planet. In other words, working nine to five jobs. I mean, you can appreciate, I just interviewed uh, M.T. Cash, and he's an Iranian physicist, who nuclear engineer, who then became a free energy uh, plasma physicist and is, uh, has gone down that road quite far and worked, created this thing called the Keshe Foundation. First was working, um, well, in all areas, but he, he moved from Iran to Belgium and uh, they, they created devices and so on. And then the, apparently the Belgian government turned against them and asked them to leave the country. And uh, then he had to go to Italy, and he's been threatened again. So I just did a radio show. Uh, actually, it was a live stream, uh, live broadcast with him. He was on audio. I was on, uh, you know, video. He didn't have the uh, video set up. But um, the bottom line is, they took down our website the next that that night. Hmm. Uh, he's now on the run. You know, I mean, he basically he has been threatened. Uh, and again, it's a, a, a Satanist. They want to torture his family right in front of him. They're trying to shut him up. But what he has is free energy. And, and so the, the way to, to do away with uh, gasoline, mm -hmm. oil, right. you know, all of this nonsense the, that, that they that's use. The, that's the dollar itself. The dollar system is based on petrol. It's, you know, it's based there you on go. The, the purchase of oil and natural gas pipelines. I mean, Ukraine is about natural gas pipelines, Afghanistan. I mean, you name it, all these conflicts. Yeah, have all, the war, all the wars. Oil and natural gas. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, I mean, people are confused over the wars because they see that this, that this oil idea is, is, is really sort of old and, and out of date. Um, but the bottom line is a lot of times we go into countries to take control of the stargates. It's much more about the stargates and the secret space affiliated types of things, ancient sites that have powers, powerful energies. Um, none of this is revealed to the general public, but it's, it's really crucial information. Mm -hmm. And Iraq is one of those places. I mean, we took down Iraq because of the Stargate there, not because of the oil. But why aren't we still there then? What, what we are. We We're absolutely there. And we're there underground. And they have, completely control, they have complete control of the Stargate in Iraq, and they'll never let it go. Mm -hmm. um, they want to go into Syria for a similar reason, from what I understand and Iran as well, but Iran is, is not going to allow that to happen. Um, and so I think they have a, a sort of important opponent to that sort of venture uh, here on planet Earth. I mean, they are trying to control who comes in, what races visit, and who don't. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, Solar Warden is the name of an interstellar space fleet that we have that patrols the solar system. Um, and this is all information from my whistleblowers. Right. So. But Solar Warden would be run by the reptilian, like the negative faction? Uh, well, the so secret space program, by and large, is run by the Illuminati and the negative reptilian faction, yes. Um, however, I think within the secret space program, which is where I get some of my whistleblowers, you're going to have someone who's, who has a soul decides to work on the dark side for a certain period of time and then feels that they have a debt they owe a debt to humanity, and they decide to come forward and, and reveal to the rest of humanity what's really going on. And that's what's really important, is that 
they're, they can't stop that. So these are the signs of hope. Mm -hmm. A whistleblower is, is your best insurance that you're going to get the truth about what's really going on. Yeah. It's not documents, because documents can always be faked. Right. right. Well, let's hope that the whistleblowers aren't going to be scared off, by, like you said, by what's going on with Snowden. Right. And all, all the overall fact that we are living constantly right now, we're in a national, state of national emergency again, right? It's because of the Ukraine situation. Mm -hmm. And it, it literally, it's like since post 9-11, we, we're living in a world of goose stepping and, you know, and the Nazi Reich. I mean, it's, it's this level That's of paranoia, right. fear, you know, everyone get in line, you can't criticize the government. You can't criticize you know, our, our policies around the world. And um, I think we, you know, we should look at Snowden as, as a hero, whether or not he was working with the CIA auspices or you know, any kind of you know, factions that were supporting his move. At the end of the day, it's heroic that he stepped forward the same way that Manning you know, leaked the information that Assange has done. Yeah. All these guys are heroic for what they've done. Let's look to them as examples. We want more people like that to, to, to leak because ultimately the system can break down if enough people basically jump ship or they, you know, they, they throw the captain overboard. Yeah, I mean, uh, whistleblowers are, in essence, canaries in a coal mine. They're warning us that this thing is imploding. And uh, Bradley Manning, I mean, I just want to say that that person, you know, he's really sacrificed himself uh, for the good of humanity uh, to get the truth out. And uh, he's, he's been raked over the coals, thrown into the brig, and I guess we won't hear from him again, doesn't look like. But... Uh, you know, I mean, one of my whistleblowers, Gary McKinnon, is another example of that. Uh, now, he did get off. He, you know, um, basically had a, had a great defense and, and was able to get out of the, uh, what they wanted to do, which is to extradite him from the U.K. to America. And his mother was completely paranoid that he would end up in Guantanamo and never be heard from again, um, with good reason, sad to say. I mean, it, it's really unfortunate, but the United States has become the Fourth Reich, for all intents and purposes. And um, a lot of people, I want to say, if anyone watches this internationally, and what I'm saying actually gets out there, um, I want to say that, uh, you know, Americans are not, are not as dumb as people think they are. And, you know, you're a perfect example. Unfortunately, the mainstream media is as dumb as they think they are. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing. Or willing yeah. dupes, let's say. Yeah, But uh, absolutely. So people can check out Project Camelot on YouTube, obviously. Yeah, and projectcamelot.org is our URL. And then your, your radio program. And on program. Facebook. And your radio program is... Um, Friday night, 7 to 9 p.m. Revolution Pacific radio. time. Revolution radio. Yeah. Right. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming on. We, obviously, we could talk for hours, but I think <laughs> we, can, we can let it to the audience to, to go and check out the archive and the library that you have available. Thank because, you. Because, you know, it's a tremendous resource. So thank you for the work that you've done. You're welcome. And continue to do. Thank you. Yeah. There you have it, folks. Another fascinating episode. I'm sure that the, some of these ideas might seem like Star Trek, but I tend to believe that the reality that we see is nothing like the reality that truly exists. So this is Sean Stone reminding you, you that you are the revolution.